sounded like you're always as tired as I am. <laughs> Good morning. There we go. That's a little better. Uh, it's almost uh, cliche sometimes for as every speaker stands up and says thank you to the elders and thank you to the church. And, uh, but I, I think I can speak for everyone who stands up here. That, that's sincere when people stand up to say that it really is an honor to stand here and to be able to, uh, especially for me, coming through the school and, and watching so many people stand up here uh, each week and each year at, at the lectures, it's an honor. And I, and I certainly do appreciate the invitation to be able to do this. Um, I wish that we live uh, about five and a half hours away. Lewisburg is so, it, most people do exactly what, Lewisburg? Is that, what, where's, where is that? What is that? It's, it's by itself in the middle of nowhere and, and uh, we're the only church in the Greenbrier County and uh, it's about 35 miles, of 30 to 40 minutes before we can come to the nearest other church uh, and it's a small church of about 40 to 50 members and uh, so we're sort of on our own out there and so this is a great uh, boost to me to be able to come back in the valley where there are lots of people and be able to and so count yourselves blessed that you have people around you and churches close to you and Christians wherever you go uh, because I wish that some of our members and I wish they could have come with me this week but they, uh, we couldn't uh, for some reasons but I wish that they could be in this area and be able to see the the strength that is here and and the encouragement that can be had and that there is life larger than Greenbrier County because we, we're by ourselves out there in the middle of nowhere. But uh, it's an honor to be here, and I, and I really appreciate it. Um, it. It might be the case that, that of all of the stories uh, in the Old Testament, maybe I'm wrong, but I would take a guess that if the story of Noah and the building of Noah's Ark if it's not number one, it's in the top three or maybe the top five of the most well-known stories of any of the Old Testament. If you are aware of the Bible, if you are understanding of the Bible, if you're um, familiar with the scriptures, or if you're not, everybody knows the story of Noah and the ark. It's just one of those stories. Uh, besides just being one that is well-known, it's a story that, uh, for all intents and purposes, is relatively short. Just three, uh, four chapters, or uh, chapters in Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9. But it has captured the imagination and it has captured the fascination and has just engulfed so many people in so many different areas of study and has just baffled people to be able to comprehend and to understand and to try to uh, put in terms that we can understand the reality and the gravity of the situation that's described for us. You can look at folks that are uh, maybe uh, the geologists. My wife is a big geology fan. She loves to study things like that. And, and you can read books that are, uh, that are just devoted to nothing else other than studying the geology of the event. You can read books by Henry Morris or uh, Whitcomb is one of the other writers that writes a lot about the flood and a lot about the, the geological happenings and the things that are the product of that or most likely the product down on the earth. And they have just book after book after book after book of of what the flood story can do for someone in that field of study. You can look, or some of those that might be captivated by this, uh, Matt Thomas was here yesterday morning and he brought with his, it was the only one I've ever seen show and tell at the lectureship, but he brought a little fossil and he was passing it around and it had seashell fossils on, up, way up on a tall ridge. It, it fascinates somebody to go out in the woods at 2,000 feet elevation and find seashells. Um, for someone who is uh, an archeologist, Evidence of the flood is something that's captivating. Uh, if you're a historian, and I'm a history lover, I love to study history, it's one of the things that is my passion. Um, it's amazing to go from culture to culture to culture to culture, some I think Matt said over a hundred cultures throughout the world, all of which have a story of this great and awesome flood. All of which we know is the original, not different floods, but the uh, an adaptation of the original. And so it's amazing to look at all of these different cultures and how it's been shaped. But then you can go and you can and talk about the uh, philosophical implications of it and those of, of how it might shape your view of theology and understanding who God is and what he has done and how he acts with people. And if, I'm gonna, if you're going to get down to where the rubber meets the road, in my mind, those last two are going to be some that are, you know, you hate to say the most important, but in essence they are. 
Because what it challenges you to do, if you're looking at this story from a theological standpoint or from a philosophical standpoint, it causes you to say, what does this story say to me? What does it mean for me? What does it say about God and his relationship to man and his relationship uh, uh, vis-a-vis me, right? What does it mean to me? How does it shape my life? What does it expect of me? What are the expectations that come from this story that say, what can I do to make my life better? What can I do to understand my life better as a result of this wonderful story? And the amazing thing is you can go through all of that amazing stuff of, of, uh, that science can give us through geology and through archaeology and through history. And then you can talk about these uh, theological things, the questions that we can ask. But yet, one of the amazing things about the Bible is you can take the story and you can paint the pictures on the walls of the child's nursery and they stand in awe of how amazing it is. Henry Van Dyke, in, in one, of the greatest, uh, one of the great passages of, of literature in my mind, is he wrote a passage and it just simply called the Bible. And my wife had it printed and framed for me and it hangs above my desk in my office. And he just talks about how amazing the Bible is and how it has traveled the world and it speaks many languages all over this world to many cultures. And one of the things that he said is it's able to, you know, wise men contemplate its maxims and try to decipher the mysteries, but yet children are awed by its wonder. And that's the amazing beauty of the Bible, and in particular for our purposes today for this study. And I said, and I think, and, and we all know the story, let's be honest. We all know the story. We can tell us what happened with Noah and what happened on the ark and how the flood came and how many days the water, how many days it was raining and how many days the water was up. When was the last time you sat down and said, my goodness, how did he get those animals in the ark? When was the last time you sat down with a child's wonder and said, wow, that just fascinates me. That how did you live with a giraffe for that long? down the road or down on the other aisle. How do you do that? That's amazing things to me. And those are the things that a child wonder. Maybe we should take a lesson from, their, uh, from those pages sometimes and just, rather than just let it be intellectualized and understand the story itself, take time to stand in awe of God and the amazing gravity of that situation. But for today and for the purposes today, I, I, I want to look at this story from that last perspective there, from, a, from a, uh, in essence, a theological standpoint. What's it say about God? From a philosophical standpoint, what's it say about me? What does it say about my relationship to God? How does it, uh, what does it tell me about the relationship that we have together? H.C. Uh, uh, Leupold said concerning this uh, passage, he made a very interesting point in that when you look at the story of Noah and the story of the flood, most people see in this great story the story of judgment and the story of uh, this retributive God who's exercising his wrath upon people. And, and with all truth, it is. And in all truth, it is. But he makes a very good point, and that is the fact that it's not just a story of judgment. It's not just a story of God's wrath executed on his people. It's a story of God's great mercy extended to a rather small number of people, but in any case, it's his mercy extended to Noah and to his family. I apologize, that was Mr. Litz, not Leupold, who made that comment. But he said simply, this event included a work of judgment and mercy of the greatest significance in the history of the kingdom of God. And he goes on to make the point that there may not have been a single event that was so great an example of God's judgment than the flood. And there won't be another one until this time ends of such greatness and of such gravity. And in the same way, there was not a single, uh, I guess it was the first great show of God's mercy. And maybe not a greater until ultimately the Savior delivers the kingdom and his children back to God. And so it has great implications just by reading the story for us and for our relationship with God and for 
our, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, for our eternal destiny. Uh, if you have your Bibles, and I, and I hope that you do, and I hope that you'll follow along today, we're going to uh, turn to the book of 1 Peter and chapter 3. Uh, we will spend, we, we are familiar with the story in Genesis, and so we will make reference to those uh, passages and, and talk about those, but we will spend our time making most of our references in the book of 1 Peter, and we're going to be in chapter 3. The, uh, one of the good things about this, and, and if you study the, the types of the Old Testament and the antitypes of the New Testament and trying to put those things together, sometimes there's some conjecture and some opinion and some people that, you know, that you can try to say, well, this is maybe a type of this and this might be a type of this. I'm, I have the blessing of I don't, I don't have to do any of that because Peter said, here's the type and here's the antitype. This is the thing, this is, we know it, this is, it's right out of the New Testament that we can learn these great things. And so uh, we're going to talk about four things today, and, and there, the points are in the book, um, and we'll try to elaborate on some of the things that we've put in there. But let's just read together. Let's start in 1 Peter chapter 3 and get a basis for where we're going to spend our time today. Let's start in verse 18 together. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. By whom he also, also he went and he preached to the spirits who were in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also now an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into the heavens and is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. And we can stop right there. If you're going to look at the story of Noah, and you're going to look at the comparison that, that we can make with 1 Peter chapter 3, I just have four things I want to share with you. And I think the first thing that maybe should come, especially in the Genesis account of this story in beginning in chapter 6, is the fact that, as I've said in the book, our sin is appalling. Our sin is appalling. And when you read the, sometimes at least from our vantage points, the extremes to which God goes to punish the, and again in our view, the extreme nature of the sin of these people, it, it can cause us to uh, maybe shudder in some ways. There are, uh, it, when you study the Bible, there are many books and, and many resources that you can use that paint what I'm sure you've heard of as called word pictures. That paints a picture for us to, with words to try to help us understand a situation uh, in a better way rather than just reading words and rather just trying to understand a concept, but painting a picture for us to visualize something. And there are resources. A.T. Robertson made a, uh, in one of his books, Great Word Pictures of the New Testament. And I like to read uh, William Barclay, who was a great historian and paints beautiful pictures of the culture and understanding something. And one of those men, in, in my mind, at least from the reading, I never had the chance to meet him or to hear him, uh, is Brother Wendell Winkler, who I the first time I ever read one of his lectures, I thought, I have never seen that many scriptures in one lecture in my life, maybe uh, with the exception of Johnny Ramsey. But he just packs it full of, of things to be able to paint pictures for us to be able to do that. In one of his uh, little lesson books, which are, are invaluable to me, Studying Sin Seriously is the book, the name of the little workbook. In one of the earlier chapters, he paints some pictures for us, or in, rather he uses the Bible to paint a picture for us to understand how serious sin really is. And he gives the list of those, and, and some of them he talks about that defiling filth. Taken from the book of Second Peter when he talks about a Christian that has has been faithful to God and then turns around and goes back to his sin. You remember what Peter says? It's like a dog. Just goes back to his own vomit. That's a disgusting picture. But that's the picture of sin. And he talks about sin that is a hard taskmaster. The slave driver, as Jesus would say, whoever sins is a slave of sin. Right? 
It's someone who was a slave driver, especially in this country. We have awful pictures of those who were slave drivers and treated their uh, people with uh, awful, uh, in a very awful way. But to me, the one that, that caught my eye is the one that's number one in his list. And he takes it from the book of Isaiah in chapter 1, in which Isaiah simply says, talking about the people of Judah, Isaiah, God through Isaiah says, the whole head is sick from the sole of the foot to the top of the head, nothing but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. That's a disgusting picture. But that's the words that Isaiah uses to describe sin, to, t to paint a picture of how awful it really is. It doesn't, it doesn't take uh, an educated person to be able to see how wretched sin is and to be able to just read the words and say, boy, this is terrible. And intellectually, it's, it's easy for us to step back and to say, well, yes, I understand what sin is, and I, I can give you the definition, and I can cite to you passages that talk about it and do all of those things, but sometimes I feel like we don't really let it sink in as to how bad it really is and to how much damage it really does, more than just intellectually understanding it, but what is it doing to my life, right? If I'm someone who is enslaved to sin and someone who is constantly involving myself in sin, how bad is it really for me? Yes, there are consequences. Yes, we can talk about those things. But really, how bad is it? And, and if you were here uh, in the time that I was here, I, I've given this from Brother McGarvey uh, in his great book of sermons. In one of his uh, books, and I'm going to read the quote to you here, in one of his sermons, he talks about the nature of sin. And if you know a thing about Brother McGarvey, he was just a giant, just a, a spiritual giant in understanding. And, and to me, as, as a history lover, I look to him as someone that I can model, and I love to read his writings. And so it amazed me as someone that I, in my mind, I hold in great esteem and great honor to hear a man say something like this. Brother McGarvey said in 1893, June 11th on his Sunday morning sermon, he said the following, I wonder if any of us has ever realized what it is to commit sin. He said, I believe that I would esteem above every other gift that could be bestowed upon me as a preacher the power to adequately conceive what sin is and to adequately set it before the people. To hear J.W. McGarvey say, I, I wish I could really understand it and I really wish I had the ability to tell people about it was something that caught my eye. And he goes on to say a number of times in my ministrations, I prepared sermons designed to set forth the enormity of sin. But I have every time felt that I've made a failure. I found, I thought, two causes of the failure. He said, first, a want of a realization in my own soul of the enormity of it. And second, the inability to, inability to gather such words and such figures of speech as would with anything like adequacy set it before my hearers. The pleasures of sin have blinded our eyes to its enormity. And so he says, I've come to the conclusion that after a great deal of reflection and a great deal of mental effort, that about the only correct gauge we have with which to measure the enormity or the heinousness of sin is the punishment that God has decreed against it. You want to understand what it is? You can read these pictures that the Bible paints for us. You can try to sit down and fathom it. And Brother McGarvey finally said, the only thing that I can think of that really tells us how great it is is the fact that the loving God is willing to send souls to eternal punishment because of it. And he would go on to say that God is infinite in all of his attributes infinite in his mercy, infinite in his love and in his compassion. And when we find that a punishment, that punishment that such a God was constrained by the justice that also characterizes him to enact against sin, I think that we shall be better able to form an idea of its enormity than we can from any other view of the matter. If you want to really understand what sin is, take a look at the fact that if you engulf your life in it, the all-loving, all-perfect, all-wise, all-just God is willing to send and to consign your soul to eternal punishment.
That's the enormity of it. And when you think of it in those terms, it's, it's a humbling thought. It's a humbling thought. And that's the image that's painted for us when you read in the book of Genesis. That's the image that you get when you read things like in Genesis chapter 6, God was sorry that he made man. That just baffles my mind. That God was sorry that he had made man. In chapter 6 and verse 6, he was grieved in his heart because of the sin of this people, saying, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Wow! That God would say, I'm sorry that I even caused all of this. I'm sorry that I have created this. I, it, it is, you have just made a mess of it. And they had to force God to say something like that. We sometimes forget, I read a book not too long ago by a man by the name of A.W. Tozer. And A.W. Tozer wrote a book called The Pursuit of God. And in the book, he makes a very interesting point of something that we forget. And that is that in a very real sense, God uh, is a person. Not that he has hands and feet and a face and all of those types of things. But God is a person in that all the qualities that you have to feel, to laugh, and to cry and to be hurt, and to have joy, and, and to love, and to share, and all of those things that you have been given came from one place, from God, the eternal person. And when we think about our sins, and to think about how our sins make God say, it grieves me in my heart, maybe it can help us to think about the enormity. How bad is sin? Well, it's bad enough that God, by his justice, is willing to send all of, the, all of those who are enslaved to it uh, to eternal condemnation. And then you go on and you read things like chapter 6 and verse 5, and you see the wickedness of these people. And you read that the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. We have... The picture in our mind, or at least I do, and sometimes we think of it this way when we come across this and we have, we have the tendency maybe to sit back and say, wow, they must have been really bad. Wow, that was awful. That every intent and the thoughts of their heart was just nothing but evil. But I think that if you would take a few minutes and go back up to the beginning of chapter 6 and find out where it began. Chapter 6 and verse 2, we're simply told the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Do you want to find out where it started? It started when someone put their own selfish desires over the desires of God. They had the commands of God. They had the law of God. They knew what they were supposed to do, but uh, as, as one writer has said, which makes me laugh, they were more concerned with the goodliness of their looks and the godliness of their character. And they put the selfish desires above God's. And that's where it started. And within however many years after that, we've come to the point in which every thought and intent of their hearts was only evil continually. Our sin is appalling. It reminds me of, of the book of Romans in chapter 1 in which you read that great passage where it begins very simply that they did not glorify God as God. And you go and you read of those things, uh, the foundation of which started from their own selfish desires. We have selfish desires, and sometimes we let them overtake us. And so maybe it's a warning to just say, maybe we shouldn't look at them and say, boy, they were really bad. But to look at us and say, we have the possibility to become, if we're not already, really bad. And then you get to, toward the end, and back to the book of 1 Peter. Why did Christ have to die? You think about Romans 1, and you think about the sins of those people, and you think about our sins, and you think about all those sins. Romans, or 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Christ suffered, why? For sins. 
And so if you go back through everything that we've just said and all of those pictures that the Bible paints and all of those awful things that you can think about it and all the stuff that Brother McGarvey said, if none of that makes you realize how bad sin is, read 1 Peter 3 and 18. Why did the Savior God have to die? Well, because you sinned and because I sinned. That's why. That's how bad it is. And so our sin in the first place is, is appalling. The second place, I think we can go to the other side, as we mentioned at the beginning uh, with Dulitz's uh, idea that in the, the story of Noah, there is a great uh, sentiment of judgment, and you have to understand the wrath of God being presented there, but on the same token, you've got to turn and you have to see in it the mercy of God. And so in the second place, I think that we can look at the fact that God's grace is amazing. Our sin is appalling, yes, but all his grace, it is amazing. Yes, it's a show of judgment, but you have to see that as a show of grace. Uh, in 1980, there is a, a book that was published by Thomas Albright, and he talks about the theology of the Old Testament. And in his introduction, he, t he takes a rare look, I guess, at, at the Old Testament. Most people, when you look at the Old Testament and, and in modern day liberalism, most people don't even think it's the same God from the old to the new. And so they look at the Old Testament God as just that evil, wrathful, you know, uh, expe expre uh, extending his judgment and, uh, and constantly punishing those people in a very retributive way. And he just, he's just, just an evil God doing all of those things. And then you get to the new and they just want to talk about the the flowery love and grace of God, and they, and they fail to see that, you know, maybe they've failed to read Ananias and Sapphira's story, and how that there are, of course, it's the same God from one to the other. But Thomas Albright takes an interesting look in that he doesn't look at the Old Testament and say, he was just an evil, wicked, wrathful God. But he says in the first part, the storyline of the Old Testament, it exudes love and excitement and hope. And to that I say amen. From the beginning in Genesis chapter 3, as soon as sin was punished, the promise was given that there's a way to overcome it. Our God in the, of the Old Testament is a God of love. He goes on to say that it tells of the Creator's love affair with creation and with man. It affirms an undying and relentless, unceasing love. As the Old Testament tells us, He loves intensely forever. It doesn't take long if you begin to read the Psalms to see the wonderful love and mercy of God. Uh, it's not as common uh, that many people look at the Old Testament that way, but I, but I think it's that uh, Mr. Albright is 100% right. Because he punished Adam and Eve, and then he promised them that something greater was coming, and then he helped them. He clothed them. He gave them the things that they need. He punished Abel, Cain, right? But he rewarded Abel for his righteousness. You've got judgment and mercy, this idea of grace. But then when you get to chapter 6 of, of the book of Genesis, it's the first time that we really have a name of this. It's the first time it really comes out and says, this is the example of God's mercy. And he calls it by simply saying that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, his undeserved unmerited favor of God as one writer has said it was simply his sheer prerogative to save not because we deserved not because they deserved or they were worthy but because he simply had a prerogative to save his people you got to be careful I think uh, to observe this mercy and this compassion and not only see his judgment but also be willing to see his mercy, and his grace. Yes, this judgment was exercised, but so also was a way of salvation, particularly when you get to the story of Noah. He chose Noah, a faithful and a righteous man, and said, we're going to use you to save mankind. Or he's going to extend mercy to say, yes, I'm going to give you the opportunity to be saved when everyone else is going to have to perish. Extending that to Noah. And maybe it's said best when it very simply says in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 1, God remembered Noah. God remembered him and was willing to extend it to him. And then you get to the New Testament and you come across through our comparison today from 1 Peter chapter 3. The same principle is applied to the salvation of men through Jesus Christ. 
the embodiment of his sheer prerogative to say. Romans chapter 5, not because we were righteous and not because we wanted it, but while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In chapter 5 and verse 8. And if you go to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, Christ also suffered for sins, notice, the just for the unjust. The one who was just and perfect, dying for we who are unjust and imperfect. Yes, we can look at, at God's judgment and wrath that ultimately will come upon sin as the wages of sin is death. But you have to look from the story of Noah and from the book of 1 Peter. That Jesus Christ is the embodiment of that. The just for the unjust. Later attributing it to the resurrection in verse 21 of Jesus Christ. And as you go through this, you look at Noah's salvation and you ask those questions. How does salvation come about? If not, God saying, here's the offer of salvation. And in the same way for you and for I, how do we have the opportunity for salvation if God doesn't say, here's my son, even though you don't deserve it, here's the offer of it. Benjamin Franklin in an old sermon, once, not the statesman, but the preacher once said that the infinite goodness originated it. The infinite originated it and suggested it. The infinite will resolved it. The infinite wisdom devised it. And the infinite power executed it. Salvation from the flood came because God said, I'd like to offer this to you. Salvation from our sins comes because God says, I would like to offer this to you. And it's given us, by his grace, the opportunity to have that. When you get to... Uh, Later down into this uh, chapter in 1 Peter chapter 3, we're, we're going to turn our attention to really, I guess, the important part of the story being the fact, I, I guess, maybe the main character, we should say. It's really not the story of the flood. It's really the story of Noah and his escape from the flood and the salvation that God offered him. Because you look at this, and sometimes we have a tendency to, or at least uh, I do, and I've noticed it in, in, in reading. Sir William Osler once said that history is simply the biography of the mind of men. To me, it emphasizing the fact that history is not just dates and events and stories and facts and history and all those types of things. History is about people. It's about people. And whether it be Abraham Lincoln or Martin Luther King, or George Washington, or Moses, or Noah. You know what they all are? They're people, folks. They're people. They have wants, and they have desires, and they have needs, and they make mistakes. And it's been the same since the very beginning for you and for me. And so when we read these stories, we have to realize that we're reading about a person. We're reading about a man who lived faithfully in the midst of this unfaithful uh, world around him. And God gave him the challenge to do something about it to do something for he and his family, and to be able to do the things for the people that are around him. And he had to make the choice to be righteous in the same way that you and I have to make the choice because we're people. Noah had, he wasn't a perfect man. We know that from after the story, right? We see the mistakes after the flood when he come off of the ark. He's a person who has a will and has desires. And he had wants and he had needs and he made mistakes. But he also had great faith in God, which makes us to be able to say, why can we not have the same? But in any, anyway, any case, we turn our attention to Noah. What is God's grace offered if there's no one there to accept it? What is his grace that extended if there's nobody there to listen, nobody there to accept it, nobody there to do something about it, to be able to respond? When you look in the scriptures and you look at Noah, this person, so little is said about him, and so little is said about his character, but what is said, it's great, isn't it? We're simply told that Noah was just and perfect, or in other versions, maybe righteous and blameless. Each of them talks about his character, his integrity, his faithfulness to the ways of God. And then you go and you think about the situation that, we're, that he was living in, right? The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence, and all flesh had corrupted their way upon earth. And so in the midst of selfishness, 
and immorality and continual evil thoughts and corruption and violence, Noah stood out because he was upright and because he was blameless and he made the decision to be righteous. And maybe of all the things that are said about Noah, the one that stands out to me, very simply, chapter 6 and verse 9 of Genesis, is very simply that Noah walked with God. If you come to the end of your life and if you come uh, on your tombstone or the epithet that is said is only that he walked with God, I would venture to say that he lived life to the fullest. If nothing else were ever said. What a great compliment to Noah. But we get to the, the point of the book of 1 Peter and the, the application that Peter draws. Very simply saying, concerning this one, Noah, while the ark was being prepared, I'm sorry, let's go back up, let's start in verse 19, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. You can go to the book of Hebrews in chapter 11 and you can find out that by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, we might just say obeyed. He prepared the ark. He did what he was supposed to do. He did, as Peter said, he answered. He makes that correlation by saying, just like Noah listened and just like Noah was able to, by faith, do what God has asked him, we also, now there is a way, there is an antitype, he says, which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but it is the answer of a good conscience toward God. His judgment was extended to those people. His grace was offered to Noah, the way of salvation. But what makes it complete is that Noah was able to say, yes, I will listen. Judgment has been extended to us, at least the warning of it. But his grace through Jesus Christ and through the resurrection has been extended. And what makes that complete is the fact that we might be able to say, okay, now I will do what's expected of me. And I will, as Peter said, answer. It's such a, a beautiful thing to watch someone read from the scriptures and be able to answer simply by reading the message and doing what's asked of them. I, I have the wonderful privilege of teaching uh, in the federal prison down in, in Alderson, West Virginia, at the, at the women's federal prison there. And we have such a great class. We have uh, such a good number. We outnumber all of the studies that are there. And I, and I believe simply because we, uh, our, our mantra is it doesn't really matter what I think and it doesn't matter what you think. We're just going to read the Bible. And that's what we do. And we do that every week. And we have great numbers. And I remember the, one of the first times we really sat down and they wanted to know about salvation. And so we started to read. And, and I told them at the beginning that every, all, the question always says, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? What do you think about And I always tell them, it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what you think. Let's just see what the scriptures say. And no exaggeration, we simply just read the stories of the conversion in the book of Acts. And as we were reading and we were going through, and, and uh, there was a young lady by the name of Eve who sat in the back row, and she became, to me, a dear friend as we went. And as we were reading, we got, I think it was at chapter 16. And she, we finished chapter 16, and, and, and I happened to look up, and she just stood up in her seat and she said, I've heard enough. We need to do this now, <laughs> right now. And I said, well, and of course, everybody smiled. And of course, my heart was melted. And I said, we're in a situation we can't really do it right now, but we will take care of it. And see, we were just reading the stories of the conversion. And, and it just, it was so moving to see somebody just, just read the scriptures and answer and just stand and say, we need to do it right now. And just this past Friday night, uh, pray for us if you would, please. There's a young lady, she's 22 years old, and she has a two-year-old girl. She's about five foot one, 100 pounds, and she's in federal prison, federal criminal today. She sits in the front row, right in the front, and she was raised in the denominational home, and uh, her parents are very, very strict Southern religious people, and she'd never been baptized. And she was telling me that she'd wanted to for a long time, but she'd promised her granddaddy that she was going to wait until she got out in a couple years, and she would do it then at her home church, and everything would be great. And uh, I didn't really say anything. We just talked and chatted. And uh, it happened to be we were studying Romans chapter 6 that night, and we had moved our way into the book of Romans, and we decided to go through and, and to study some of 
the conversion stories because they all want to know about baptism. That's the one thing. Um, I'm the guy who teaches baptism, doesn't believe in the rapture, and what is the other? doesn't believe in the spirit in their mind. That's the way everybody knows. It's on the compound. That's the way it is. But they wanted to know about baptism, and so we studied, and she was just excited to go home and do it, and we started in, and we finished with chapter 22 and, and Paul's account of his conversion. And I looked up, and, and she had her head down, and she had a tear in her eye, and she looked, and she said, how soon can I do this? And so in a couple of weeks, we're going to be able to do that. So pray for us that the chaplain will allow us. But uh, they're very special to me, and it's so moving to see somebody just read and just answer. Just do what's asked. And that's what Peter says it is, right? It's God extending to us salvation through Jesus Christ. And this is where the, at least the beginning of it, baptism into Jesus Christ, it's the beginning of that. It's the answer that says yes. And there's some great comments from William Barclay in, in the book that I'll uh, uh, call your attention to. It's the pledge. It's the answer to say, yes, I know that you've offered it to me. This is my promise. This is me saying, yes, I'm going to do it. And that's what it is. It's the answer. And then we come to the very end of this. And we read about a very interesting thing in, in the book of 1 Peter. In which he says, you know, and you think about this, 120 years to build a ship. Even in that day, that's a long time to build a boat. 120 years. But we know that's how long Noah was there. And we get a clue as to what he was doing for those 120 years. And we find out that he was, through Jesus, or Jesus through Noah, was preaching to those spirits. And I reject the idea that he was in purgatory somewhere teaching. That's foolishness. Noah was preaching. And he was teaching. And for our last point, I'll simply make the statement that his plea is for all. He didn't just give it to eight people and say, y'all go and take it now. He gave it to those eight people and offered it to them and then evidently had said, now please go share it with other people. I think it's true, it was true then as it is now that God desires everyone to repent. Desires all men to come to a knowledge of the gospel, a knowledge of the truth. His plea is for everyone. It's for you and it's for me, but it's for our neighbors. And it's for those that are around us. And who's going to take it to them if it's not us? Let me read to you this. I know I'm a couple minutes over, and I'm will conclude with this. William Baxter, in a conclusion, says eloquently, when you take the story of the, the flood of Noah and the story of Noah, it's just a simple story of redemption. It's a sinful people. It's God extending that grace to those people, telling them that judgment is coming if they don't. And a simple man saying, yes, I'll do what's asked of me. And William Baxter, in one of those old sermons, makes the correlation in this way. He says, in the deluge, while there is anger and justice, so there is an ark, a dove, an olive leaf, the smoke of sacrifice ascending, and over all the rainbow hues of love and peace, the fierce surging waters like the frown of God, the rainbow like his smile of love. You've seen this wonderful display of love which God has made, and now it's done for you. You've seen the Lamb of God bleeding, groaning, agonizing, dying, not to save friends, but to secure happiness for his foes. Will God permit you to slide all of this love and all this uh, sorrow and yet hold you guiltless? Will you steel your heart against all that God has done and Christ has suffered amid all of those manifestations of tender compassion? Will you force your way down to ruin and madly seek that perdition from which the Redeemer died to save you? Stop, he says, I entreat you. If you shrink at the difficulty of obedience, think of the danger of disobedience. If the weight of the cross appall you, think, oh, think of the brightness of unfading immortal crown. God loves you. Can you doubt it when you look upon the cross and its bleeding victim? Christ loves you. Can you doubt it when for you he left the starry crown and laid his robes aside? On wings of love came down and he wept and bled and died. I appreciate your attention. Thank you.